Not the prettiest college basketball game you'll ever see, but an effective one for Kansas. Welcome to Sports Beat KC, Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Wednesday, December 2nd, and I'm Blair Kirkham. Beat writers Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell stop by to talk about the Jayhawks' 65-62 victory over Kentucky on Tuesday night in the Champions Classic and about the game's breakout player, Jalen Wilson. He was committed to play elsewhere a couple of years ago, and Gary tells us about his path to KU. Jesse breaks down what went right for the Jayhawks, especially a terrific hustle play by Christian Brown in the final half minute. After a break, we hear from new Royals outfielder Michael A. Taylor. Beat writer Lynn Worthy was among the gaggle of reporters who talked to Taylor earlier this week. We'll hear about Taylor's expectations for the 2021 season. So, Let's get started with Jesse Newell and Gary Bedore. Okay, Jesse, Gary, you're both here, and we watched the Kansas-Kentucky game last night, uh, a, a late night, right, 8.30 start. We don't usually get 8.30 starts unless, of course, it's the NCAA tournament, f- fourth game of, you know, of four, and sometimes those don't start till after nine. But anyway, made a late night, but it was a good night for Kansas. They end up beating Kentucky 65 62 not the not the most artistic game I've ever seen but I thought Kansas showed some some toughness and some grit and I think experience paid off for KU last night and um, and the, undoubtedly the star of the game was Jalen Wilson so Gary I wanted to start off by asking you you know how did um, uh, Jalen Wilson's been in the program it's his second year in the program but he didn't play last year. Just take us through his coming to Kansas and why we're just getting to know him. Yeah, Jalen Wilson uh, originally signed with Michigan in uh, high school out of Denton, Texas. He, I believe his family grew up a, a fan of the Fab Five, but he decommitted when they had a coaching change committed to KU in 2019, June, and uh, missed la- – well, he played in one game last year in a minute of another game, and he uh, needed surgery on his leg, on his ankle. So uh, he missed the whole season as a red shirt, but he did get to practice the la- after he recovered from the surgery. He could have played last year, but – you know, in 10 games or so, I think at the end, but they, he, he decided, uh, I guess it's always up to the player, even though self is runs the show, <laughs> but, uh, he decided that the team was so good. There was no reason to try to buy for scrap minutes after missing so much time. And he red shirted and has been, I guess he really went to work in the summer at home on his body and uh, he's made that improvement. You see sometimes in guys from their freshman to sophomore year, even though he is technically a red shirt freshman. Yeah. You know um, the, one of the themes of the game last night was, you know, KU has experienced players and Marcus Garrett and um, Ochai Abaji and David McCormick um, and Kentucky's rolling out the four freshman starters along with uh, Olivier Saar, but Wilson doesn't have college experience, right? And he, uh, even though it's his second year in the program, and yet he was in the second half anyway, when he had 21 of his 23, by far the best player on the floor and the only Kansas player to have a field goal until um, Abaji hit a, hit a three late, what was it about less than, what about three minutes to go in the, in the half. It's um, uh, Jesse, maybe you can, uh, you can straighten this out for me, but I, I just don't remember a Kansas player taking over a half quite the way that Wilson did in in uh, in that game last night. Yeah, and uh, it's it's interesting um, for Kansas. They're in a weird spot right now. Bill Self's in a weird spot because all preseason he was hyping up Dave McCormick. Dave McCormick's a great kid. I mean, he really is. He's thoughtful. He's intelligent. He's worked hard but he's just been bad so far. He's been really bad. And so not only has he been bad, he's kind of cost KU in different ways offensively because his man, which most of the time was Saar inside, 
uh, some of the times it was Jackson who blocked eight shots, would kind of just camp in the lane when he was in. And so in the first half, when Jalen Wilson had two points, Jalen would drive, he would get by his man, but then he would get met in the middle of the lane by David McCormick's man. And so KU is sort of still trying to force this lineup. They're still trying to force that one big in there, but it's amazing when they go to five guards, just how much everything opens up. And you saw how effective Jalen Wilson could be. I mean, I wrote this last night on Twitter. KU's best play right now is Jalen Wilson attacking a five man who is trying to close out on him. And we saw, we've seen in the past, you know, how difficult it can be for a guy, even like athletic as Yudoka Azabuki, how hard it is for him to guard in space. And when he gets a guy so much smaller than him on the court who can drive around him, it's hard to block shots from behind. It's much easier when you're a help defender and coming forward. And so we saw that from Kansas last night. I mean, Jalen, he just, if, if a guy of a big man is coming out to guard him and he has to, because Jalen is basically the five man in the lineup, you can't have a big man go guard Christian Brown and just shoot threes over the top of you or Ochai Abaji, same sort of thing. Uh, when this happens, it's just a huge mismatch uh, for KU offensively that uh, Wilson is strong enough, talented enough, skilled enough to take advantage of. And you saw it over and over and over again. Not only that, he just has this confidence that uh, obviously showed last night when he had a couple big threes, kind of one of the biggest moments of the game as he just rose up. And and that's the danger of that five man. I mean, it, it, Jackson for Kentucky was completely dominating the game defensively when KU had David McCormick in the game. And Jackson was a complete liability when KU took Dave McCormick out of the game and Jalen Wiss could, could take him off the drive or shoot over him. So that's the kind of matchup thing that KU can create when they go super small. I just don't think Bill Self's super comfortable with it yet, and he doesn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and he doesn't want to completely shoot the confidence of David McCormick. But I think this is trending very quickly toward the KU becoming a five-guard lineup, and because uh, one big reason for that is because Jalen Wilson has played so well so far. Yeah, not unlike the 2018 team, though, right? Um, that was uber successful. That's a great point. And, and this is even a step further because, yes, KU tried to force two bigs then, um, but then it became really evident that centering four or, or, or spacing four around Yudoka Azubuki inside was much better with driving angles. And then if that help defense did come, you could just throw it over the top to Yudoka, who would slam it in. One of his great skill sets was having good hands and dunking it. Again, unfortunately for Kansas, that's not one of Dave McCormick's really good seal, er, skill sets. And he's not very good right now at sealing his defender when another guard comes around and tries kind of has a driving angle. So it's sort of a mess for KU offensively when they have one big in the game, uh, when obviously 2018, but, but that's, I think that's my point is exactly that Bill Self sort of just came. He, he came at peace in 2018 with knowing that this was not going to be his best defensive team, but it was going to be a damn hard team to stop offensively. And that's sort of the piece he's going to have to come with this year's team. I think from seeing him so far, which is Jalen Wilson is going to get dunked on. Sometimes he's going to give up easy layups sometimes, but he is going to cause a whale of a lot of problems on the other end offensively. And KU's just going to outscore a lot of opponents. I think that's what you saw from the KU game. Once KU committed to it, I think it's what you're going to see from him a lot moving forward. Once Bill Self and his staff finally, you know, have to face the reality and have to commit to this thing going long term. Well, it's what we saw in the first two games, right? When they, they, they put up a pile of points against Gonzaga and, and St. Joe's and, and then we get to last night, and it's uh, you know Kansas has five points in the first ten minutes, and I'm going, what in the world is going on? And listen, I, I get the tight rims thing. I I kind of you know I, I always think that's sort of a silly argument, but it seemed to be true last night. Or the way the ball was coming off the rims, and neither side was shooting really well. Um, and but Kentucky never got out of it, and Kansas finally did you know hit enough threes and, and enough jumpers to. Uh, to look like it had some offensive flow there for a while. And Baji had, you know, he had a, had a, th- what, a couple threes early and then the big one uh, late in the, in the second half. So um, it, it was, uh, Gary, I want to go back to the, the, bef- the pregame. There was some, uh, some speculation that Marcus Garrett wasn't going to be available on, um, you know, uh, f- for this game. What, what, take, take us through that. What, what happened? Well, Self on his pregame radio show with Greg Gurley, which was taped three hours before the game, flat out announced without even being asked that Garrett would miss the game. Uh, He stressed that he didn't have COVID, even though they were COVID-like symptoms, sort of uh, bad shortness of breath, stomach problems, a fever, and uh, he said he wasn't going to play. Well, then somebody at the game saw him warming up 
and tweeted that and uh it got revealed that he would play self said after the game that he felt better but he had called it, garrett had called his uncle and uh Shortly after talking to his uncle, he said he was going to try it in warm-ups. And I guess he looked good in warm-ups and felt better and played uh, 35 minutes. And now they hope to get him some meds for whatever's wrong with him. Yeah, um, I was following that on social media before the game and thinking, without Garrett, I, I just don't know how you know, how Kansas is going to be able to respond. I you know, nice pieces, but he really is a, a leader. And st- statistically, you know, it was fine. Eight points, five rebounds, missed his only three. But uh, you just sort of, if you're, if, if you follow Kansas, you feel better with him on the floor than, than him not there. And Jesse, I want to go back to a point that you made about Kentucky's length and size. I don't know if Kansas is going to see a team quite as long as Kentucky. I know, I know the Zags have their bigs, but Kentucky's got, you know, four or five guys whose wingspan is just ridiculous. And we saw that with the block shots. But the fact that Kansas ended up out rebounding Kentucky last night, I think kind of bodes well for the the, 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 term, the, the determination that Kansas played. And as I read in, um, in, in uh, w- one of your stories this morning, just some smart play um, on the boards. Uh, let's just go specifically to the – to the Christian Brown rebound off the off the miss free throw, the uh, the uh, Ochai miss free throw uh, with with less than a minute to go. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of why I think Bill Self could sort of fall in love with this team because this is the type of effort he loves. You know, he's made his absolute best teams are the talented ones that he gets to play hard. But this team might not be his most talented, but they're always playing hard. You know what I mean? And, and so that's the kind of ones that really he feels great about because it's taken on his personality. And um, I mean, listen, he's had good players in the past. And he makes the most out of them. And, and some guys are just more active than others, if you will. But the Christian Browns of the world. Yeah. So there's a free throw. Ochai Abaji shooting two free throws. KU's up three. There's 26 seconds left. And Kentucky has basically <laughs> NBA length at four positions on the block to rebound this free throw. And it's, 30 seconds left in one of the biggest, most anticipated college basketball games of the year. And Christian Brown basically just sort of shoves a little bit the guy in front of him, tilts him off balance. Uh, The guy goes up with one hand kind of in a soft way for a lazy rebound. He misses it, and it falls right into Christian Brown's lap, and he goes around and and dribbles a a few times and gets fouled, and then he makes a free throw, which ends up being pretty important in the grand scheme of things since Kentucky hits a three on the next possession. But it's just the sort of play, I mean, John Calipari unprompted brings this up because this is what coaches see. This is what Hall of Fame coaches see after this game. They want You want to know what wins games. You want to know, hey, what's the difference between two really good teams going at each other? It's Christian Brown trying hard with 30 seconds left and Kentucky not trying so hard. And you see that with Jalen Wilson. I mean, the guy is 6'8", 215 or whatever, but he goes after every ball. And, and um, you know, Christian Brown has 13 rebounds. Jalen Wilson has 10 rebounds. So that's sort of the point I'm talking about, too, where – KU is going to have its lumps playing small, but if all these guys compete this hard, you know, go for rebounds. I mean, that's got to be the big concern for self is if Dave McCormick's not in there, you might not get rebounds. Well, if Christian Brown gets 13 and Jalen Wilson gets 10 and Marcus Garrett scraps on the last possession um, and elevates to get rebounds, then you can make up for that. You you have kind of an effort where you feel like all these guys are trying really hard to do what's meant to be done on that end, and, and you feel better about the group you can have in there, even if they're not as big. So I think it's a big key for Kansas. I thought it was a huge key for them in the last minute last night. And like I said, when, when Hall of Fame coaches are both bringing up the same thing, how this game was won, how this game was lost, both you know Bill Self says toughness and John Calipari says, hey, you got to box out <laughs> with 26 seconds left and not let, you know, six foot five Christian Brown push you around. And, and in that game, Christian Brown pushed a lot of guys around and won some toughness plays, won some 50, 50 balls. And KU ended up winning the game. You know, when I saw the replay on your story that we'll, uh, that we'll link to in the, in the show notes, the one thing I did notice, it was a really smart play by, by Brown. He, the ball hung on the rim for like an extra beat. And, and I think, you know, he was experienced enough to let it, let it play, and uh, it had not come off the rim when the Kentucky player, and I can't remember who it was on the inside, made his c- kind of committed to the jump, and and Brown pushed him and got a little a little bit of a shove, 
not not enough for a foul, but a little bit of just to put, put him out of position. And and Brown just took full advantage. It, it is the type of rebound that you don't expect the the free throw shooting team's player to to make. But but Brown was smart and heads up and, and made the play. So um, yeah, that, that was a, that was a critical moment for for Kansas last night. Uh, good win for for KU. Uh, Kentucky's second straight loss. I don't know how they're unraveling this in uh, in Wildcat Nation. I know they can't be too happy especially with a team that shot what three went three for 21 from behind the arc. And uh, I, I think Calipari has got a lot of teaching to do with this Kentucky team, but so what's, Hey Gary, what's coming up next for KU? What uh, they finished, uh, they got a game in a couple days who they got. Yeah. And Thursday they play Washburn uh, with uh, the Ichabods have four starters from the Kansas city area, which is, kind of need for them, yeah. even though there won't be any fans at the game. Uh, then KU plays North Dakota State on Saturday, and they play Creighton on Tuesday. So KU has a lot of games coming up in a row, and uh, it's been announced no fans for Saturday's game, and then there will be a reassessment for the next week by the chancellor. So that should be coming up soon. Just if they ever do have fans, it'll only be fifteen hundred. Gotcha. So, hey Jesse, what what does Kansas need to get done in these? Um, you know, against Washburn and um, and North Dakota. Not, hey, North Dakota State's a good program, but what what does what does Kansas need to get done in these next two games before Creighton? Yeah, I mean, I think you schedule these games to try to get guys that haven't played as much some minutes. Uh, and right now, I think the number one priority is you just. Got to get David McCormick settled down. I mean, the guy right now just is trying way too hard. He's always off balance. He's um, doing things too quickly. He's trying to shoot over double teams. He's trying to shoot it every time he touches it. Uh, You know, they got to figure out a way to get him. Uh, Me saying they should go five out doesn't mean I think that David McCormick has no role on this team. I mean, that's obviously not the case. Certain matchups, you're going to want a body to lean against people. But um, I, I could definitely see a diminished role for him. And right now, I mean, if we're being frank, you know, statistically, he's on the verge of unplayable. I mean, he, he's not helping defensively. He has no block shots this season. And offensively, it's sort of like a black hole when he's not at the free throw line. I mean, he was one for nine again last night. So again, I'm David tries hard and, and he's, he's improved himself over time, tried to improve his body, trying to be a leader, all these sorts of things. So this is not, it's not a character flaw. It's just a stated fact right now that that he is costing Kansas. I mean, it's, he's, he's not worth playing at this point. So uh, if KU could get anything done these next two games, it would probably be really good for David McCormick to get in there, get some confidence, take a deep breath, you know, get get in there against overmatched foes and kind of get his rhythm a little bit because uh, he looked lost the first three games and Kansas is going to need him the rest of the season, even if it's in the more limited role than we thought a week ago. All right. Sounds good, you guys. Great catching up with you, Gary Bedore and Jesse Newell, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks. Sounds good. Hey, it's Blair. We have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Star's award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. It's been a busy few days for the Royals. Among the moves are the signing of lefty pitcher Mike Miner, who was with the club a few years ago, and also the signing of free agent outfielder Michael Taylor. Taylor had spent his first seven Major League seasons with the Washington Nationals and won a World Series ring there in 2019. He's a 237 career hitter with 53 home runs. His best offensive season came in 2017 when he hit 19 homers and 23 doubles. Taylor is a fast and athletic outfielder and could become the Royals' next center fielder. Here's the conversation he had with reporters who cover the Royals. Com, Josh Vernier, who's with uh, 610 Radio, Len Worthy's with the Kansas City Star. 
Alec Lewis uh, with The Athletic, Dave Scretto, Associated Press, and some of our TV folks and radio folks are on here too. So uh, we usually let, uh, since I'm the oldest of the old guys, we usually let the next oldest guy, Flanny, start this stuff off. So uh, Flanny, go ahead and uh, get us going. Okay. Hey, uh, welcome, Michael, first of all. and Thank you. Just tell us, uh, run us through how this came about and what, what was your interest uh, in Kansas City and the Royals? Uh, I don't remember the exact date, but I was put on waivers by the Nats. Uh, so getting that call from my agent and then, uh, you know, just uh, I talked to a few teams. But after I spoke to uh, Dayton on the phone and Mike on the phone, I just knew that this was a place that I wanted to be. Um, so if I was going to get an opportunity, I was going to sign. And uh, luckily I was able to do that and, you know, really looking forward to it. What, what appealed to you about this situation? I mean, did you go down the roster and look at the outfield? And, you know, obviously Alex Gordon retired uh, and there's a spot there, but uh, what, was, what was appealing? I think just after those phone calls, um, you know, the culture that they have over there is special and it, it's something that, you know, as a player you want to be in a place, one where, uh, you know, the team wants you and it's just a good fit for me personally, I think, um, you know, obviously, Physically, it's a big outfield, and I love playing defense, and I just think, um, you know, I can, I can help in that way out and, uh, and, you know, on the field. Dayton told us that you're a pretty honest self-evaluator. Uh, what do you think you need to do to get back to where you once were? Putting the ball in play early in the, in the count. You know, I think I get to too many two-strike counts, but I've been working on that over the years, you know, just um, – shortening up my swing, not trying to hit the long ball every at bat and, you know, take singles and doubles and things like that. So cutting down on the strikeouts is a huge thing. Um, you know, I'd, I like to be more consistent in the outfield with my throwing to bases. You know, I feel like that's it. that can be a weapon for me. So just making sure, you know, I'm taking care of my arm and putting myself in a position to make plays like that. Go ahead, guys. Michael, what, um, uh, first of all, uh, welcome. Hello. And, um, w when you talk about, uh, sort of the, the, the need to put the ball in play a little bit more, I mean, for you, is that something that, um, you feel like you were working on, um, you know, more recently in terms of like making adjustments to swing or approach, or is that something that's just been sort of continuous for you that you've been trying to make some, some changes there? Continuous. Uh, but more recently I made some, mechanical changes to my swing to try to make um, more contact and be more consistent. You know, a lot of it is timing before I had a leg kick, you know, which gave me a lot of rhythm and, you know, a leg kick can bring some good things, but I felt like um, it, it made me a little streaky as far as uh, timing. And so getting rid of that is, uh, you know, an effort to, to make more contact and then just an approach and a mindset, you know, going up there and taking a 70% swing or, whatever that number is for me to where I can be consistent and put the ball in play is, um, you know, far greater than running into a few balls here and there. And how, um, how recent were those changes? I just asked because I know um, I've heard a lot of guys talk about this shortened season was sort of a tough year to show any sort of adjustments you've made and, you know, especially with the layoff and the, just the disjointedness of it. Well, it's been about two years. Um, you know, but this year I felt like I made big strides just in, uh, you know, getting comfortable after going from a leg kick for so long, basically as long as I can remember to uh, no stride for a while. Honestly, in that first year, I, I felt like I was stuck almost hitting in in mud or cement where I just, uh, you know, I didn't feel like I had any rhythm or any kind of uh, momentum going into my swing. It was just from a standstill and launching and you know, that can bring other problems also. So, you know, it's, it's been a bit of a long process, but this year I really felt like it was my swing instead of just something that I'm, uh, you know, trying to adopt. Michael, Dayton uh, mentioned that you had, had known Pedro Grafal and, and Renee Francisco maybe a little bit. What, what experience do you have with those guys? Well, I played in the Dominican League uh, winter ball a few years ago and Pedro was the manager. Um, Renee was the GM and 
I was only there for a little bit, but the little time I was around him, um, it was great. I actually, over the All-Star break, rode to the Capitol with Pedro. Uh, so I got to talk to him quite a bit on that road trip. And just playing for him was a, you know, a real pleasure. A lot of that same culture that I think is built over at, um, in Kansas City, you know, he brought to the Dominican and just letting guys go out there and play and believing in guys and, uh, you know, obviously still expecting a high level of baseball. But, um, you know, just having that family culture. Congrats. Welcome. Thank you. Michael, I was hoping you could expand on, on that culture that you're talking about, because I would assume that, that most organizations like to present that kind of culture. What, what makes Dayton's presentation better or different? Well, I can't necessarily – I mean, I can't speak on other teams. Uh, I've been with the Nationals my whole career, um, and I can't really speak on the exact culture that you guys have over there. You know, I'm just on the outside looking in right now, but – just in our conversation, you know, you get a sense of how genuine he is. He's a very honest person, um, you know, just a stand-up guy. And, and everything that he is, is saying, I wholeheartedly believe. And, um, you know, it might not be any different than anywhere else, but um, it is somewhere that I want to be. And then Alec brought up uh, Pedro and Rene. Any other relationships in, in the clubhouse, any of the guys that are here uh, that you go back with? Yeah, there's a few guys that I've played against. Um, obviously, I saw a lot of Franco when he was with the Phillies. Um, I played against Witt um, in the minor leagues. And uh, Witt actually sent me a text when it came out, and I appreciate that. So, you know, I'm looking forward to playing with a lot of these guys. And, you know, there will be a lot of new faces, but – that's part of the fun of, uh, you know, signing somewhere else, just making new relationships. Wid might be trying to set you up to hustle you on the golf course. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, he wouldn't need to hustle me. That would be easy money for him right now. He, he just he just won a tournament out at Pebble Beach, so he, he's hot right now. I'd stay away. Okay. Is he a scratch golfer? He's pretty close. Yeah. I'll be on his team then. <laughs> I think that's the right partner. Hey, Michael, go ahead. How uh, how how important was uh, and Dayton mentioned that you know the the idea of you know giving you the opportunity to play on a pretty much everyday basis, or at least that's the idea going into this. How important was that in your discussions with him? And um, I mean, if I remember right, I mean there's been some times in the past where you've been you've had different roles, right, in Washington. So how important was the idea of getting the chance to play every day? You know, obviously, uh, everyone wants to play every day. And for me, you know, in our conversations, I, I told them that I, I want to go out there and earn it. Um, you know, I'm not expected to be given anything. So, you know, it was nice to hear, but th at the end of the day, I know I have to perform. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm just going to take it one day at a time and go out there and uh, try to play my game. Is there, I mean, and like, I know you said that everybody wants that opportunity, but do you feel like, you know, that everyday role would maybe bring something more out of you than maybe we've seen in the past or just in terms of the consistency? I mean, um, it seems like that might go hand in hand. I don't know if that's what you're looking at also. Definitely. I think when you can have consistent at-bats, it's easier to kind of get up to game speed. You know, when you're playing every few days or sporadically, um, you know, it can be it can be tough to be on time at the plate. And, you know, that's kind of what brought about this swing change. It was out of necessity when I wasn't getting everyday at bats. Um, you know, just makes it easier to go out there and, and compete. And I think with consistent at bats, it'll be even, you know, easier. So, um, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I think it allows me to do a lot of things else on the field outside of hitting, you know, just getting a rhythm on the bases also getting comfortable out there and, uh, you know, stealing bags or playing, playing defense. Um, you know, when you, when you have limited opportunities, you kind of sometimes fall in that trap of trying to do everything in one day. You want to go four for four every day. And, um, you know, when you're playing every day or you know you're going to play or you're going to get the at-bats, it allows you kind of to relax and fall into, uh, you know, a spot where you just go out there and play and not try to do too much. 
That'll do it for today. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. And a special thanks to our newest team member, the incomparable Monty Davis. Great to have you aboard, Monty. A tip of the cap to Jesse Newell, Gary Bedore, and Lynn Worthy for their contributions to today's show. And links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we've got another deal for you, especially for those who want to deep dive into the Stars' terrific Chiefs coverage. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto-renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. How do you get it? You go to KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. That's KansasCity.com slash SportsPass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? I know I do. Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports, news, features, commentary, and analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe. And I know that's a lot of dots and dashes. If you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I'll get you to the right place. Whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Thursday with another episode.